Good morning. It's Wednesday, the twenty seventh of September, and this is Govind Raj Ethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day: What J.P. Morgan chief Jamie Dimon said but did not make headlines. The U.S. dollar is at its strongest in twenty twenty three, and the rupee is fighting back. Massive GST or goods and service tax notices are being thrown at gambling and gaming companies. Is the law on the right course? New disclosure guidelines for unicorns are likely. This is a core report with Govind Raj Ethiraj. What Jamie Dimon said that did not make headlines. Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, is in India and has good things to say about investing here, including the timing of his firm's announcement. of including india in its bond index which promises billions of dollars of investments in india's government bonds jp morgan chase by the way is the largest us bank by assets demon whose roots are greek his grandfather worked in the bank of athens started his career in 1982 and then joined city group before moving on to jp morgan chase in 2004 becoming ceo and chairman soon after forbes says his move to unload 12 billion dollars of subprime mortgages in 2006 buffered his bank against the 2008 crash He's also known to have political ambitions and has been repeatedly asked if he wants to run for office this year. Now, here is what he said but did not get much highlighted in the reporting so far in Indian media. To a question on if India felt like China 15 to 20 years ago from the Economic Times, he said that India is a little more complicated. Moreover, he pointed out that China was small when it started and had a long way to go just to start. They were able to bypass it and they did not have the sloppiness of democracy. his words not mine and something that someone should have asked him to clarify a little more since he lives in one which is a democracy he did add that china has serious issues too whereas india has a lot you can do here picking up further from the same interview on clients moving supply chains from china to india he said they have seen some but it is not just that when you go to nations you need things that are conducive to people wanting to do business here fair regulations not regulations that are used to defend the incumbent transparency consistency of taxes rule of law it's all of those things that will get more people to do things here he said now it's not clear whether he's saying this as a general prerequisite or pointing out a problem in india on policy making steps going forward demon clearly refers to things people talk about inconsistent taxes he says that he remembers companies debating huge tax bills from 10 years ago and companies avoid putting direct investment on the ground because they're not sure they can get it done properly he talks about companies in the united states now canceling projects because it's taking so long to get the permits for example in solar and wind and he adds that's true for all nations so if you really want solar and wind if you really want people to build plants you've got to have consistent rule of law once again he's mostly referring to the united states but he could well be referring to india too And on the inclusion of India in JP Morgan's bond index he points out quite squarely that while it is great for India he does not I repeat does not think it has a huge material effect it's a sign of maturity he says it's the country it's the ratings it's the transparency it's the government finances all those various things but in general it's a very good thing he also touched on the global economy saying america was doing fine and india is obviously the fastest growing nation but when you look at the future it's very different because of huge fiscal deficits quantitative tightening and so on on the topic of financial markets in general the stock markets were quite listless on tuesday for the lack of any other word with the bse sensex and the nifty 50 ending broadly on a flat note the bse sensex closed at 65945 that's down 78 points while the nse nifty 50 closed down 10 points at 19665 so the action seems to be more in the forex and commodities markets right now particularly in the forex side with the dollar behaving like a bull that cannot be restrained putting pressure on currencies across the world it is at its strongest in 2023 driving down stocks across emerging markets thanks to lower investor appetite for riskier assets Overnight on Tuesday the yen fell to its lowest against the US currency since October the euro to its lowest since March and the Swiss franc the weakest since May all of this against the dollar the greenback's rise the fourth straight daily gain was fueled by indications from the federal reserve last week that it may keep interest rates high 
As the surprising strength of the economy leaves inflation the central bank's predominant concern, according to Bloomberg. Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis President Neil Kashkari said he expects the U.S. central bank will need to raise interest rates one more time this year if the economy is stronger than expected. The appreciation of the dollar across the board is continuing on the back of hawkish remarks by Fed members who stressed again that U.S. rates are likely to remain on hold for a long period of time, Bloomberg reported an analyst saying. Now back home. The rupee fell again on Tuesday on the same bets that interest rates in the United States will be kept higher for longer, which will keep capital in the United States. The rupee ended at 83.23 against the US dollar compared to 83.14 in the previous session. So to get a sense on where we are and how far the rupee could go or if it could buck the trend, I reached out to Aninda Banerjee, head of research for Forex and interest rates at Kotak Securities, and I began by asking him how the rupee was faring right now. See, if you look at the performance of the last 10 months or so, that's almost a year till date, Indian rupee is an outperformer. Why I'm saying like if I take a basket of top 26 currencies, somewhere around 5.5% has been the average depreciation of any currency against the dollar. Indian rupee is almost flat against the US dollar and it's an outperformer. The Indian rupee has done quite well, not just in terms of the relative performance, but when you compare it in terms of the volatility, It has been one of the least volatile currencies in the world. And it's primarily because of the strength of the economy, inflows, and also the very effective intervention from the central bank. This is where things are right now. So if you were to look a little ahead, do you see the rupee continuing to resist the pressure from the dollar or really being where it is right now? Right. We will continue to see the RBI to be exceptionally active because they have adopted a very simple and effective FX policy, which is to target the relative volatility of the currency rather than trying to target a particular level. RBI will increase its intervention if the dollar continues to rise globally, but a wild card in this entire equation is oil prices. If oil price continues to rise and let's say it gets past $100 a barrel, which many are expecting, then it can create problems for India because India is a major importer of oil and other energies. So unless oil rises, RBI will be able to contain the volatility. But if oil continues to rise along with the rise in the US yields, which is at a 15 to 16 year high, and plus the dollar index, then it can be a triple whammy for the Indian rupee. And then the volatility can rise in spite of RBI intervention like we saw last year. So what's your sense? Is the dollar now somewhat flat where it is or could there be other spikes which would make it even stronger? Actually, the biggest advantage for the US dollar are to one, the growth outlook. If you compare it with other currencies like in Europe and also in Asia Pacific like in China, the growth outlook for America is much better. That's point number one. And because the growth outlook is better, it is able to sustain much higher interest rates. So a higher interest rate differential, higher growth differential, that is what is driving the dollar higher. And until and unless we see a slump in the U.S. economy, which still remains elusive because same time last year, the market was anticipating a slump by now. That is not happening. Now the estimate is it may happen sometime in the second half of next year. So the longer the U.S. is able to defy the call of a slump, the stronger the dollar will get. Right. Anindya, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Goods and services tax notice on gamers run into tens of thousands of crores. GST tax notices running into tens of thousands of crores are being served on gaming and gambling companies or also known as games of skill or chance. In the case of one company, Delta Corp, a listed company that runs casinos that sit on ships mostly floating on a river in the state of Goa, The GST tax demand is over 16,000 crore rupees. Either these numbers are in the realm of fantasy or they're so real that the bottom could fall away from most of these companies. It is of course possible that the answer will be somewhere in between. A quick background, in July 2023, the Goods and Service Tax Council said it would impose the top GST slab of 28% on the full face value irrespective of whether it was a game of skill or chance. Skill gaming platforms currently pay 18% GST on the platform fees, also known as gross gaming revenue. The government's revenue secretary, Sanjay Malhotra, according to reports, however, had mentioned that GST rates on real money gaming were always 28% on full face value, and this amendment was only clarificatory in nature. 
to understand what exactly is being said here, what is the nature of these demands, given the massive amounts being talked about, I reached out to Girish Vanwari of Transaction Square, a tax regulatory and business advisory firm, and I began by asking him to help define the kinds of notices that were going around and for what to understand the nature of taxation involved here, the policy approach at play, as well as the specific context. If you look at the companies which you mentioned without getting into a particular company, issue is that when you play a game or you bet, you put in money into that respective app. So let's say if I put in 100 rupees into that app, and that 100 rupees into that app is for the chance which you take and also the services which that gaming company renders. So suppose, for example, I put in 100 in a company, 10 may be for the platform charges and 90 would be for the game I play with. What typically also happens is this 90, if I win, keeps on multiplying and I play more games with it. So 90 becomes 180, 200, 500, so on and so forth. Now the question is that on what is GST payable? Is GST payable on 100? Is GST payable on 10? Or is GST payable on that multiplied 500? So the notices which you see today are actually, some of them are GST on 500, that 28% of 500. Whereas the argument by the people who run these kind of businesses is that it should be 18 or 10. Now, there is Karnataka High Court decision in the game of Gamescraft which says that it should be on 10. And now there is a clarificatory amendment which says that it should be 28% on 100. Not 28% on 500. So that's the dispute all about. What do you pay your GST on? On 10, 100 or 500? And you're saying that 10 is really what you're paying the platform for the services that it's rendering to you? Yes, yes. As a business, I'm rendering the platform of only 10. Now it's like a bank here. When you go to a bank, the services you take for the bank, you pay GST on it. Now when you deposit money in the bank, you don't pay GST on it. So the money that I could potentially earn from, let's say, taking a bet, I will only otherwise pay income tax on if it's an earning? Yes, it is a speculative business, as you know. So when you gamble, suppose 100 becomes 500, on 400, you would pay speculative income tax. Depends upon which entity puts the bet and the rate would depend upon that. But whether GST is payable on 100 or 10 or 500 is where this law is going to be tested. Right, but at this point you're saying so far and at least going by the way these companies have been operating, we are not paying any indirect tax or GST on the amount that we are actually winning or putting at play in a gaming or a betting context. Yeah, what is relevant is amount which you're putting at play, which is 100. Winning in my example is 400. So the new law is that if you put in 100, GST should be on 100. That's the new law. The understanding on the basis of which all these companies have operated is that only 10 rupees will be... Only on 10 it is paid. Now, whether that is right or wrong, that law will tell us with time how it evolves. But as of now, it's paid only on 10. The department tried to claim on 500. And now the new amended law, which is a clarificatory law, which says it's on 100. So now on 100, I think, is there a secondary issue now of applying this retrospectively? The way the amendment is that it is clarificatory in nature. So like if you look at the Vodafone case, Vodafone case also was clarificatory, right? Till the whole law got settled in a, in a different way. So now is the clarificatory amendment saying always the law was like this? Or is it that from today onwards the law will be like this? Those are things which we have to really very eagerly see and evaluate how it is. Because to say that it is a clarificatory thing and all in the past should be taxed on 100 at 28%, I think many companies will go back. But you're saying also that there is a 500 and there is a 100. So notices that we are seeing is for the 500. For what? 500, yeah. The clarification also of 100. But the notices are at 500. So the best case is that most companies may end up or having to pay 28% on 100, even though that's bad, you're saying, right? And may be able to challenge the other one. 18% of 10 versus... 28% of 100 is significant. And it's like all in the past 7 eight years since GST gave it. Right. Now, there are two kinds of companies from what I can see. Because it's a publicly listed company and their statements have been shared with the stock exchanges, Delta Corporation is a physical entity. As in, there are casinos, there are ships, people go and gamble and so on. The other entities are app-based. So, is there any distinction in the way the law looks at these things? 
you know, both are same, both are having troubles on this interpretation. Okay. So, which means if I was on a casino and I went and put 100 rupees, I was paying earlier only for that 10 rupees that was casino's fees or coming on board or whatever. And the rest of it, I was not paying any tax. Correct. Look at it this way. When you are depositing money in a bank and you're paying service charges to a bank, you pay GST only on the service charges. So you don't pay deposit money. That's the debate. Is me paying money in an account in a casino, is it an actionable claim or is it a service? Right. And does this also mean that the players did not seek or were not fully aware or conversant of this potential hit that would come later? The players don't care because as far as GST has to be charged by the rendering of service. The renderer of services are the game gaming. So if I had gone to a casino, which I never go to, then at that point of time, I should have been charged the GST, which I have not been charged on. Okay. So the companies you're saying also did not know at that point of time or the last six years that this could be contested down the line? I mean, this is speculative, but I'm just wondering. I wouldn't say last six years. I think the Gamescraft issue, as I read in the public domain, has been in the air for the last year and a half, year, year. So for the year, year and a half, this exposure was real. And there was a hope that the Karnataka High Court decision would mitigate that exposure. But now with the clarification, the exposure is real. I'm not saying the law is right or wrong. I don't have a judgment on it. What I'm saying is, this is the issue and let's see how it evolves. Right. And last question. So is this something you feel is being driven by a matter of belief and principle by the tax department? Or is it, you know, we've got to chase so many avenues for raising revenue and therefore this is one of them? No, I don't think this can be an avenue. It's a matter of principles that is it on 100 or is it on a 10? So let's see how it evolves in the judicial interpretation. Right. right. Girish, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, bye. And how the legal business is booming. If I were to go by the number of startups in the legal space, including founded by those who've spun off from older legal firms, I would know conclusively that more money is being spent on legal costs than ever before. Exhibit number two, or B, is clearly the number of fresh notices flying around, you've just heard about one, arising from new laws and regulations, mostly in the realm of tax, both direct and indirect. If I were to project, I would say that this is one of the hottest growth sectors to be in, in India, if of course you're qualified to be so. Some of the largest tax notices running into tens of thousands of crores, as we've just talked about, have been served this week to, among other things, casinos and gaming companies. Be that as it may, obviously the companies in question are all fighting back and will fight back and, as they say in America, lawyering up. And therefore, it's not surprising then to learn that legal bills in India Inc. are rising quite steadily. An interesting study by the Economic Times says legal expenses of some 3,972 listed companies rose about 21% to 63,807 crores in the last year thanks to heavy spending on disputes and increased compliance costs. If you obviously include companies large and small who are unlisted, that figure should be and must be much, much higher. Now, legal expenses are somewhat broadly defined on the balance sheet and could include spending on litigation, arbitration, professional fees, regulatory filings, penalties, fines and general stamp duty, among others. Now, the fines and penalties, as I understand it, could be a much larger component than, say, legal fees paid to law firms. But suffice to say that all of this is a massively growing business, which means the cost of doing business and the complexity of doing it is obviously increasing. And here are the five big spenders on legal costs. The top five for the last year were Reliance Industries at about 2,900 crores, Sun Pharmaceutical Industries 2,300 crores, Infosys 1,684, Larsen and Tubro or LNT 1,512, Fortis Healthcare about 1,399 or 1,400 crores. Two of the five are in healthcare and pharmaceuticals, as is evident, though Fortis's problems might be more historical and to do with a change in management. By the looks of it, of course, this financial year might see more of the gambling, gaming or casino companies hit the top of the sweepstakes. Speaking of sweepstakes, India's Ministry of Corporate Affairs is looking to frame new guidelines for large unlisted companies, including unicorns, that's privately held startups with a value of over $1 billion, another ET report or Economic Times report has said. This is to ensure that the companies adhere to corporate governance standards and are under supervision 
Under the proposed framework, the companies could be mandated to submit their quarterly filing of financial reports with the Ministry of Company Affairs. Now, this is interesting because one is many of these statements are filed, but more because the capital involved is private and the damage caused to the country is more reputational. And what I mean by that is there are no, at least at this stage, no banks involved nor small shareholders. Of course, this is bad enough if we are touting the number of growing unicorns and some turn out to have fudged accounts or involved in some other accounting skulldudgery that makes everyone at the very least look foolish. And then there is the issue of bolting the stable door after the horses have left. Either way, this is tricky territory because, for example, why is a company with a value of $500 million any less worthy of careful supervision, at least in the eyes of those who have put that money in? So, wading into a territory that is best managed by the owners of private capital who are paying for their excesses already, you may say, may not be the best use of government time. Meanwhile, we have a final set of guidelines just issued for angel tax with clauses and schedules which have made the whole process unbelievably more complex and pretty much against the original grain of the objective of taking a bet on a young and upcoming venture with some premium. The Centre on Tuesday notified the final rules outlining valuation methods for non-resident and resident investors under the new angel tax mechanism based on changes made in the Finance Act 2023. And to close out on this, angel tax, income tax at the rate of 30.6% will be levied when an unlisted company issues shares to an investor at a price higher than its fair market value, which will in effect be decided by the tax authorities. Now, there are five valuation methods to grapple with and the new rules will be effective from September 25th. And hmm, the unpaid Ambani children. Billionaire Mukesh Ambani's three children, as directors of Reliance Industries Limited, which was announced recently, will be paid only a fee for attending board and committee meetings, the company said in a resolution seeking shareholder not for their appointment on its board, according to agencies. The 66-year-old Mukesh Ambani also drew nil salary from the company since the 2021 year, although other executive directors, including his cousins Nikhil and Hital, are paid a salary, perquisites, allowances and commission. The three children, twins Akash and Isha, both 31, and Anant, 28, will only get a sitting fee and a commission on the profit earned by the firm. The terms of the appointment of the three are the same as the ones in which Ambani's wife Neeta Ambani was appointed to the company board in 2014. She earned a sitting fee of 6 lakh rupees and a commission of 2 crores in the 2022-23 fiscal year, which is April 22 to March 23, according to the company's latest annual report. That's it from me for today. Have a great day ahead. Don't forget to log into www.thecore.in. Read our newsletter. Keep logging into our site to see the latest insights and business news. And of course, do send in your feedback if you like this podcast on govindraj at thecore.in. Bye for now. This was the core report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>